and run the next uh, talk uh, is from uh, or uh, wise and uh, is about uh, python uh, rpc and uh, pubs up over uh, web sockets uh, it's a pre-recorded talk and uh, we will play the video and uh, then a q a starts uh, with or uh, here uh, as well and uh, you can ask uh, your questions uh, to or about uh, his presentation. First of all, I have to say that I'm uh, uh, amazed that I have to present to, to host a session uh, from all and uh, uh, have a great talk, uh, everyone. Hi, everyone. I'm really happy you are joining me on this talk. Uh, we're going to be talking about Python, RPC, and pubs up over WebSockets. I'm Or Weiss, um, I'm founder at Authorize and at, uh, previously at Rookout. Uh, I come from a cybersecurity and development uh, uh, software engineering background. And uh, I love Python, probably just like all of you guys. And I love building things with Python. And uh, I'm uh, excited about sharing uh, what we've built here uh, with you. So uh, before we dive into the open source packages that I'm gonna share with you, and I'm going to go into their design and uh, into their concepts and also how to use them. Uh, before that, I'm gonna talk about the problem space itself. So as you all know, the cloud is growing, the edge is exploding, more and more elements of software are kind of eating up the space uh, and becoming more complex, adding more elements, it's no longer just running a simple server on one machine. It's multiple instances. It's multiple services in the cloud, uh, third parties interacting with one another. It's edge devices, IoT, compute devices that are deployed across the field. It's things running both on-prem and on the cloud collaborating. Obviously, crazy scale with stuff like Kubernetes and serverless, where it on the fly changes the amount of instances that you have and uh, obviously things that are going towards the edge. Uh, with all of this complexity, our software is becoming more complex and we need to connect all of these elements together. We need to keep them in sync. We need to find a way to share data between all of them, uh, have the state that we have on the on-prem synced with the cloud and what we have in the, at the cloud also sync to the edge. And the obvious question that remains is, uh, how do we do that? How do we connect and scale everything uh, with this ever-growing complexity? Um, so that's what we're trying to solve with these packages. This is what we'll be talking about both with RPC and PopSub uh, while using WebSockets. Before going into the specific packages themselves, let's look at a specific example. And I brought the example that brought me to develop these packages, an open source project called Opal. Uh, which you can find at opal.ac. Um, Opal deals with the world of uh, authorization. So let's say we have an application and we want to control who can access it, the different roles, permissions within that app. Um, uh, the, an, a modern way to approach this today is to use something called OPA, Open Policy Agent, which is essentially a microservice for authorization. The application can query it at any moment in time to understand if it's allowed or not allowed to perform an action. Uh, but as our application scales out, we are confronted with a problem. How do we keep the state of the application and the state of the authorization microservice and also the state of all the other uh, relevant data syncs that we have, our billing service, our sales management, all of those different elements that uh, comprise our solution. How do we keep them in sync with our authorization layer uh, as well as with our application? So this is uh, where, where Opal comes in. It's essentially a layer to synchronize uh, the application and the authorization layer it uses both a server for main management and a client that sits next to each uh, policy agent, uh, filling it with the data that, uh, that it needs. And it does this through a WebSocket pub sub channel, which we'll be talking about in a minute. Uh, that channel allows uh, Opal to keep OPA in sync uh, throughout time as the application progresses. And with every little interaction, when you're adding a new user, when you're inviting someone new, it uh, will integrate that information into OPA instantly. 
Um, if you're doing or you're building authorization for application, by the way, I really recommend that you look at both Opal and OPA. Uh, so this is one key example of how we need to have something that is spread out our entire application with the different uh, sidecars of authorization. We need to keep all of those in sync with things that are running you know, on other clouds uh, in addition to ours. So let's break down the challenges or requirements that we have here. So first of all, we need this to be real time. We can't afford to have a polling solution. We can't have uh, everything delayed. When you apply an action in a modern piece of software, we expect everything to apply in real time. For example, in the Opal case, if you invite a user in, you expect that user to be able to access that application immediately and not at the next deployment or when the next uh, polling interval uh, hits. Uh, in addition, we want it to be bi-directional. We want both components, components to be able to share data with one another. The concept of a server and client, when you're talking about cloud, cloud native infrastructure, kind of deteriorates. Uh, both sides need to trigger one another sharing data. An updated one layer at the authorization component, for example, in, our, in the Opal case, uh, can affect a different client or a different server. We need all of those to constantly uh, be in sync. So they need to be able to trigger one another in a bi-directional fashion. Um, we need easy networking. So we already mentioned this. So we're looking at the cloud. We're looking at the edge. And uh, we need all the different components, no matter where they are, to be able to communicate with one another. So we'll be traversing the entire internet. We'll be traversing firewalls, we'd be traversing routers, we'd be entering VPCs and on-prem networks, and we need it to be, no matter where those software elements are deployed, that they'll be able to communicate with one another in a bi-directional, real-time way. So we need something that enables us to go with easy networking, to traverse with ease. We need something, in addition, that is durable. Uh, because of that widespread area and a lot of different connections, a lot of those connections might be severed at one point or another. So we need a system to be durable. We need it to be able to survive and reconnect as uh, things change. And lastly, we need it to be scalable, especially if you want to run this on Kubernetes or serverless or anything of uh, modern scale today. It always uh, ends up relying on the ability to take one instant instance and scale it out to many to support higher uh, workloads. So these are all their requirements that we have. And now let's look how we can use the different uh, elements of our architecture uh, to approach them. Um, so we'll be looking again, RPC, PubSub, and web WebSockets. So for the real-time uh, bi-directional aspect, uh, WebSockets are really uh, a good way to start. First of all, they create a bi-directional channel. While they rely on HTTP, they enable both sides to trigger a conversation on an ongoing channel. So unlike uh, general HTTP or RESTful HTTP, where you trigger a request, get a response, and terminate, and often terminate the session, WebSockets stay up constantly. And both sides can trigger uh, queries or requests on top of that channel. Um, WebSockets all, also contribute to easy networking. Because they're based on HTTP, most routers, most firewalls would be very forgiving for that. And also, they save, uh, they save us a lot of friction with creating an easy direction. So clients can trigger an outgoing HTTP connection, going easy through the firewall. But after the connection is established, because it's bidirectional, now the server can also trigger requests on that existing connection. Um, dur durability and flexibility we're getting from RPC. The basic concept of RPC is just being able to call remote functions. So in a minute, you'll see what we'll be doing is exposing specific Python functions to the other side. By exposing functions, we're ex essentially uh, connecting the two Python interpreters, enabling any element of code to be shared between them. So we can add more functions as we need uh, to get to the, both the durability that we need to kind of maintain that, and also to add more capabilities. Lastly, PubSub, uh, the ability to subscribe to, a, to events and publish events and have those reach all of the subscribers uh, will really enable us to take this to scale. 
So in a minute, we'll see, we'll be taking a one-to-one -one RPC channel, and we, then we can create many of those. And on top of that, through the extensibility that we're getting out of RPC, connect that to a pub sub channel, and then move from a one-to-one -one kind of relationship to a one-to-many uh, kind of relationship. So let's dive in. And uh, we'll start by looking at the design of uh, the first package that we've built, uh, Fest API WebSocket RPC. Uh, it's called Fest API, by the way, because one of the fundamental uh, building blocks that we use is the Fest API uh, server, which I'll elaborate more in a minute. Um, so for the first of all, the basic component of our RPC connection is the RPC channel. Essentially, it's a JSON-based channel uh, that provides the ability to pass both requests and responses for uh, functions. A request will be targeting a specific Python method that we exposed. Um, and in the end, it looks something like this. As you can see in the screenshot here of the code, you can see we have a server that inherits from RPC method base, and it exposes specific methods. For example, in this case, we can see it exposes a concat method that takes two parameters, concat, Concacts them, uh, connects them, and returns the string value. Uh, on the other side, we'll be calling these methods for an interface that looks something like this: other dot method, and calling that method. So in this case, we'll be doing other dot concat and passing the two arguments that we want to concat concatenate. Um, so to build this, we'll be using uh, async AO. As you can see, where our func functions here are, are have the prefix async to define them as async functions using coroutines. This will really enable our code to be uh, suitable for real time. Things will be running concurrently within our uh, RPC server and RPC client. Uh, obviously, as we mentioned, we will be using WebSockets for having it bidirectional. And we'll be using Pydantic uh, to get serialization. Pydantic uh, really works well with Fest API. It's a, a native uh, um, uh, library that Fest API uses, and uh, we'll be using it to define our RPC messages, both for request and response. And uh, we'll be using Tenacity, another uh, cool library, to uh, maintain that durability that we mentioned. So first, look. let's look at a key piece of code in our RPC server. So when it receives a WebSocket connection, it reads JSON content out of it and uses uh, Pydantic here with RPC message to parse the data. And then we get a, a basically a Python class called message. And we can check, is it a request or is it a response? And then trigger the behavior accordingly. So that's really the basic functionality that we have here, the ability to pass on a serialized message, have it uh, target a specific function name with the specific parameters and have that invoked, wrapped into our response, and then sent on the wire as a response where the other side can wait on it and then receive the response, parse it, and pass it to the calling component. Uh, within the uh, RPC client, uh, which is triggered via a async with call, uh, we have our basic wrapping using tenacity, basically call our connect method wrapped with retry and we pass in a configuration telling it to constantly retry. So if it fails, if it throws an exception, if it gets disconnected, uh, tenacity will take care of reconnecting for us. Tenacity uh, provides flexible configuration. We can literally go into it and tell it we want some exponential back off. We want you to wait 10 minutes before you try again, stuff like that. And we can expose that Fest API WebSocket RPC exposes that to the user. So you can also use it directly yourself from there, but it also comes with uh, uh, exponential back off with some randomization just as a good best practice. Uh, so that was uh, RPC. Now let's see how we take it to the next level to PubSub. So RPC enabled us to do a kind of one-to-one -one conversation. Now we want to go and enable the one-to-many. Uh, and we want to leverage our RPC to do so. So the basic component that we've built uh, within the uh, Fest API WebSocket PubSub 
uh, package, which you can find here in GitHub, is the event notifier. It essentially uh, registers subscriptions for callbacks. Um, and you can see this is the basically the signatures of the main methods of the event notifier. And you can see the main one that I've opened here, trigger callback. It literally uh, picks up the subscription that's passed to it when you call notify, and it just calls a callback function. Um, so that will really work well with our RPC implementation because RPC, as you remember, is just about calling functions. So uh, on the um, subscribing side, um, using RPC would just be accessing the RPC channel, going into other and calling the subscribe method. So we're literally calling subscribe, the, the same logic within the event notifier on the remote component. And when we uh, publish an event, it works the same way. We call back into the remote component and tell, hey, publish an event for me. Um, so just by relying on the RPC's um, callback architecture, we were able to plug in something really simple that just remembers who subscribed to what, who subscribed to which topics, and then just call callbacks onto the remote side. So in that fashion, we moved really quickly from having a one-on-one -on -one interaction to a one-to-many interaction. Um, lastly, we need to be able to not only scale out on the clients. So imagine now we have a <clears throat> pub sub server and we have many clients serving it, but we may want to also synchronize with multiple server instances. Cause remember, we want to be able to run this uh, with multiple workers. We want to run this on Kubernetes with multiple instances or on Lambda serverless with mu multiple instances. So now we need to sync those multiple instances. So in case we have one client connecting to server one, but uh, server B is the one that's triggering the notification, it will propagate to the right server and then through that to the right client. Uh, for that, we're using another library called Broadcaster, which is also really cool. It enables you to, uh, in an abstract way, to interact and use both Redis, PubSub, um, Postgres, Listen, Notify, and Kafka all our classic uh, best basically message queues that we can use. And we use them essentially as a backbone PubSub. So our own PubSub relies on the backbone PubSub to uh, propagate messages between uh, the different instances of the server. So this has a key advantage of uh, shifting the workload. First of all, um, deploying, let's say, a new Kafka instance could be rather heavy. Um, by shifting the workload to the uh, to the WebSocket pops up, we basically uh, enable most of the work to happen at each server node, and only when we have to propagate it to the backbone pops up. So uh, we can then utilize less resources. Unlike uh, our Fest API WebSocket pops up that we're describing here, Kafka, even RabbitMQ, they require more resources. They require memory. They require uh, uh, storage on disk, they require more redundancy. Um, here, so we can save a lot on those resources by uh, only passing what we need between servers uh, to those theirs. Uh, but still, we can connect to them really easy with the broadcaster um, interface for our Fest API uh, WebSocket pops up package. Uh, so let's have a kind of a quick review of our stack. So we're using Fast API for the basic server infrastructure. We're using WebSockets for the client's WebSockets because Fast API, while it's great, their client implementation uh, has some hiccups. We're using Pydentic for serialization, both for the subscriptions uh, that we're passing on the wire, and obviously the, as we mentioned, the uh, messages both for. RPC requests and RPC responses. And uh, uh, we use tenacity, as we mentioned, for uh, the durability fa factor, for the ability to reconnect when things fail. And we're using Broadcaster to expand our PubSub between servers if we need. 
Um, so now where we, now when we have a basic grasp of what these two packages are and what they deliver and how they address the problem, uh, let's see them at work. So we'll start with the uh, RPC side. And uh, we can see here uh, two simple examples of both the server and a client using the uh, package. Um, if, let's start with the client code. We can see that the client is running within an async IO loop and essentially just calling concatenate on the other side. So we have client.other.concat and we're passing the values that we want. And then we wait for it until we get a response and we print a response out. Um, in addition, we have uh, the server side where we can see that we expose one method. We can expose that concat method, uh, getting those two variables and concatenating them. Um, and establishing that into our fast API server via a RPC endpoint, we just pass to it our concat server definition, exposing those methods uh, and running this via UV core. Uh, so let's just run this and see how it behaves. Um, so we'll start with the server so it can uh, it can wait for it. the connection. So the server is up and waiting. And now when we trigger the client, uh, we can see it run and we can see that we got our concatenated string. We, it's essentially ran on this interpreter, went to the other side, called this function, got the value, got it back and printed it. Rather straightforward, uh, but still a pretty cool response and uh, it works smoothly. Um, now let's move for a slightly more advanced example, uh, bi-directional interactions. Uh, in this case, it's not only the client calling uh, uh, functions on the server side, but also the server calling functions on the client side. Um, we'll, and we'll be also using those for synchronizing between the two uh, sides, between the two components. Um, so you can see here that in addition to the server exposing the concat method, now the client also exposes methods. And we have two, we have allow queries, which is essentially a function that uh, signals an event within the client telling it that it can start sending requests to the server. And we have allow exit. So it will tell the client to uh, wait a random period of time uh, and then exit. So the server essentially controls the interaction with the client. The client here does just as we described, it connects to the server and then waits for the server to trigger it via calling that method and setting that event. Uh, so it waits for that event to be triggered and otherwise it doesn't continue. Um, it then calls that concatenate method just as before on the server side and uh, prints the result and then waits uh, on the server to uh, let it know when it can exit. Um, so uh, let's run this. Oh, one more thing, the server side, in addition to um, uh, exposing the concat method, it uses on connect to tell the client after it waits for a while to trigger its queries. And when the, when the query of concat, when concat is called, it also, in addition to returning the value, it also in the background triggers uh, the allow event uh, for exit. Okay, so let's uh, let's run these examples as well. Again, starting with the server. So we're running the bi-directional server example. The server is now waiting and uh, we'll run the matching client. And uh, you can see that both sides interact. And then now after that delay, the client exited. So we saw that exact flow. And of course, also the concatenated string that we wanted. Uh, so you can see we can have both server and client uh, triggering methods at one another and uh, also using those for synchronization, which is really great when we're working at scale. Uh, let's take it a step further. And now let's talk about our uh, pop sub client and server. Um, here we have a slightly more advanced example with uh, pop sub uh, where we'll be combining, in addition to pop sub, we'll also be combining a classic RESTful API server with fast API. So let's start with our uh, server example. 
So our server, just, just as before in its Fast API and exposes instead of an RPC endpoint, a pub sub endpoint, and uh, it exposes a uh, regular HTTP route at slash trigger uh, that sends event through the pub sub. We can see the uh, function that is called, it waits a bit and then it publishes the ev events for guns and germs. It waits a bit, then it publishes an event for germs. And then finally it publishes an event for steel and adds uh, data. This is a reference to a book that I like, just by the way, and this is the author of that book. Um, on the client side, uh, we have that mirror image of a client initiating and waiting for events uh, for both uh, guns and germs, having a callback to on events. So we'll be seeing this print happening when that callback happens. And we'll also have another, uh, a later subscription to steal where we are calling a different method where we'll, be run, where we'll be printing these information, this information points and also terminating the client, which is kind of similar to our allow exit kind of behavior before. And obviously running this as async AO. Um, so, okay, let's, uh, let's run this. Again, we start with the server, just having it uh, up and running. We'll have the client running and uh, nothing will happen here initially because the, everything is waiting on our trigger event. So now let's go and uh, approach our server locally. And so we triggered the server and we see that in addition to the browser asking for the fev icon, which is interesting, the trigger went correctly and it triggered the events on the client side, as well as the final event uh, triggered by this call also passing data. Awesome. And now if we had, we can have multiple clients uh, subscribing here, you know, uh, uh, we can uh, actually uh, do that. And you know what, it's not that interesting. So we, we can have multiple clients subscribing here uh, and all of them receiving the uh, updates at once uh, running in parallel. So we review the code. So now you know if you want to use these packages, you can go in, uh, fetch them from uh, GitHub and uh, or from pip. You can just pip install them. Uh, pip install. Um, you can do pip install fast API WebSockets RPC and pip install fast API WebSocket PubSub, and they're ready to go. And you have those code examples also available in documentation on our uh, GitHub. Uh, really easy to start. So that was our session. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I invite you to stay a while and listen a bit further and ask me questions in our breakout room, which you'll be getting a link to in, our, in the chat uh, uh, right now. Um, and of course, you're welcome to look at these packages that I've shared with you, as well as uh, other projects that I've built that uh, use this. Authorizing that I've uh, built with Asaf Cohen, which also leverages uh, Opal AC, which is a solution to uh, manage your authorization. And Opal AC that I mentioned that uh, is uh, synchron that synchronization layer that uses uh, FastAPI WebSocket PubSub to uh, make sure that the data reaches into uh, uh, your open policy agent. And also Ruka, which is a previous company that I created that while not using these packages, uses a similar pattern to enable you to set breakpoints on the fly in production. Uh, so those breakpoints, when they're triggered, they're triggered through a WebSocket connection that uh, runs within your code, waiting for you to set that breakpoint. Cool. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this talk. And look forward to hearing your questions and getting your feedback. And uh, both here on PyCon as well as on GitHub, uh, you're welcome to open pull requests, issues, requests, uh, and I'll be happy to uh, chat with you. Uh, thank you very much and uh, enjoy the rest of the convention. Hi, Or, how are Hi. you? Great, uh, hope everyone enjoyed the talk.
Uh, unfortunately, the talk was uh, a little bit longer, but I have, I think we can uh, cut one question, uh, which is uh, why would uh, you use PubSub over uh, web circuits on, on message? Over on message? So uh, why would you use um, PubSub in general? So the PubSub channel will give you the kind of scale to uh, instead of having one, you can have many instances at once. And with the PubSub solution here explicitly, you can also scale it out, as I mentioned, they talk through other PubSub solutions. So you can also scale it out on the backend side. Um, hope that covers the question. OK. Uh, unfortunately, I uh, have some connectivity issues. If that's okay, uh, I, I don't think that we have more time for another question, but uh, you can always reach uh, our chat room. Uh, yeah, and also, if you want to chat with me, me longer time, you can find me at Opal AC. There's a link to a Slack channel there. Happy to answer questions uh, all day long. Okay. And I have to say that uh, this was a great uh, talk for me. Uh, hope, I'm glad you liked it and hope everyone enjoyed. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.